You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. He doesn't want his love for his wife being shared with another. That is a holy, righteous love. That is a good thing. And God's not jealous of us, but he is jealous for us. As a loving father and husband, he wants our best. And here's the thing, he knows, God knows, that if we have a false image of him, that will lead to a false worship to him. And any false worship to him will lead in a separation from him. And he doesn't want that. What does it mean when scripture indicates that God is jealous for us? Today, Pastor Ron will show listeners how this jealousy from God is a righteous one, despite the word having a negative connotation with it. Just like a husband has a healthy desire for the sole attention of his wife, so does the Lord desire our whole hearts. Have you allowed other things of this world to replace God's place in your life? The Lord loves you and knows that your best state is the one that has Him at the center. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Exodus chapter 20 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. This commandment is forbidding to making of an image. Now, let me ask this because people ask this question. Is God saying then that I, I can't have a picture of Jesus? Or what about a cross? Am I not allowed to do that? Well, I want you to know the, the Orthodox Jews still are and were back then very upset of Christianity that, that came along and started drawing pictures of Jesus and, and having a cross and things like that. But is God against art? Or better yet, is God an art hater? Well, no, he's not. Because we know that it's not far from here, from Exodus chapter 20, that God is also describing to Moses how he wants him to make the tabernacle. And when he makes the tabernacle and tells him how to specifically make it, actually in the curtains are all these cherubim, angels, uh, that are supposed to be woven in. And then on the side panels, palm trees and pomegranates. And then over the, the Ark of the Covenant itself, you have two angels whose wings touch in the middle and to the far side touch the very ends of the walls. It's very beautiful. It's very artful. It's very ornate. So God isn't against art. But he is concerned that we would make something, here's the thing, and bow down to it and worship it. Notice he says in verse 5, do not bow down to them nor serve them. So the issue would not be art. The idea is making an idol and a perceived image of God and bowing down to worship it. So you can have a picture of Jesus in your house. That's great. By the way, it's probably not what Jesus looked like, right? I've gotten some stuff in the mail over the years from charlatans. You know, they try to sell you stuff or whatever it is, do crazy things. You know, prayer rag, pray over this rag and God will answer every prayer you have. Or, but we don't know what Jesus specifically looked like. But you might want a picture of Jesus. Awesome, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, the problem, though, is if you're actually praying to that picture in order to communicate to Jesus, then there's a problem. Nothing wrong with having a cross unless you're bowing down to that cross in order to communicate to the Lord. Because then that is a, that's a false worship. Then that's having an icon in order to connect with him. That's the issue. That would be a clear violation of this commandment. Whether it's a painting or a cross or a statue. Uh, he says, here's the denotation. God says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Any representation in earthly means by which God would be worshipped. Now, why does God set this prohibition? Well, we've touched on it a little bit, but let's go a little bit deeper in our second point. That's the motivation. Why did God give this command? Well, I'll tell you why. Because God knows the tendency of our fallen nature to associate him in earthly terms, whether it's with our hands, which some people have done, or in our minds. And, and when we do so, we belittle God, and we inadvertently worship a false god. I mean, idolatry ultimately tries to make God more manageable. If I could create my own personal representation of God, then I can seemingly, you know, control God. I can perform rituals to this God to appease my conscience. I can entice it to uh, meet my expectations. In the long run, if you create an idol, you create for yourself a user-friendly God. God forbids that. So think about Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Her issue was location. 
It wasn't necessarily a, an icon, but it was a location. She's arguing with Jesus. Hey, we Samaritans, we worship here at this mountain. We know you Jews. You, you worship over there, you know, in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. And Jesus is saying the time has come and now is where it doesn't matter where you worship. It's not about location. It's about your heart. And he went on to say this. You need to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, John 4, 24. And those who worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, among the many things that it means worshiping God in spirit, one of the most obvious things is it's obviously not worshiping him through an image, right? God wants us worshiping him in spirit, with our spirit, with our our true person, with the help of this Holy Spirit. But then Jesus asks this and mentions this, in spirit and in truth. There's the clincher. I'm worshiping him in the spirit, but in truth. And where's truth found? Right here in God's word. John 17, 17 says, thy word is truth. And we'll talk about that more as we move along. Now, in ancient times, here's what's kind of interesting about an idol, though, when we think about the spirit. People believe, perceived back then, and still do today, by the way, who worship idols, that when they are worshiping this idol, this statue, this icon, they are literally connecting through the spirits, through some spirit, to their God. That's what they believe. And so they might bow down to this thing or they might give offerings to this thing. And they believe that that image takes on the spirit of the God that it represents. Now, they, may, they believe they're making a connection. And the truth is they are making a connection. But it's not a connection with their quote-unquote God. It's a connection with demons. The Bible teaches us that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 19 through 20, Paul is talking about this very subject about idols. And and the first thing he brings up is is about how they give offerings to these idols. He says, is an idol anything? Look at this carved image. Is that really something that people offer their food to? Is the food offered to an idol anything? And by the way, this is what they do. I've been to many countries around the world, and you'll find shrines made out to these various idols, and they, and they have food there. Like I've been to Japan, and you find shrines to Buddha all over the place. And I've been to them, and they might have some fruit out there or maybe some noodles given uh, to Buddha. I, I've seen uh, just some sticks of Wrigley spearmint gum. I, there's tipping Buddha. That's all I got, some gum here. And I went one time, no kidding, I was there. I just arrived, and it was, it was winter time, and, and there was a Big Mac. It was in its packaging, just fresh. I could tell it was fresh and hot because there was steam coming out of it, and I was getting really hungry. And I was almost like, I felt like taking a bite, you know, and then just putting it back, you know. I didn't do that. And so Paul in that passage is saying, is the idol anything or the offering of the food? No, that's not the issue. Then he goes on, verse 20 says, but here's the thing. When people make sacrifices, they're sacrificing to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to have fellowship with demons. That's the thing. So they're making this connection in the spirit. Yeah, it's a spirit of demons. Pretty radical. Now, look what God says again in verse 5. You should not bow down or worship these false images because I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. I don't want this happening because I'm a jealous God. Now, we see that term jealous and we think of it in the negative. We might think of times where we were jealous for something. Oh, I wish I'm jelly. I wish I had that, you know. It's like a little boy who wrote a letter to God. Dear God, what does it mean that you're a jealous God? I thought you had everything. Well, God is not jealous, you know, that he needs something, he has everything. And, and God is not jealous of us, of what we have. Really, God is jealous for us. God wants our best. In fact, God likens his love for us as a husband for his wife. God says in Hosea 2.19, I will make you my wife forever, showing righteousness and an unfailing love. Isn't that great? Well, God loves us so, so much. So you think about a husband who's in love with his wife. He is jealous for her love. In other words, he doesn't want to see another man in her arms. A loving husband wants no rivals. He doesn't want his love for his wife being shared with another. That is a holy, righteous love. That is a good thing. And God's not jealous of us, but he is jealous for us. As a loving father and husband, he wants our best. And here's the thing. He knows, God knows 
that if we have a false image of him, that will lead to a false worship to him. And any false worship to him will lead in a separation from him. And he doesn't want that. So it's interesting. When you read the book of 1 John, the book of 1 John is like the book of love. I, the word love is mentioned so many times. John, this, the disciple of love, writes about love. He writes about all this love of God that he has for us. And then at the very end, the last verse, 1 John 5 and verse 21, he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. It seems like it's just kind of thrown there. But what he's saying is this, any idol would keep you from that love, from that love and his love for you because it's a false worship. It takes you from God. God wants exclusive rights. Now, God is saying then, you worship then not the way you perceive me, but the way I've called you to worship me. And this is something God established from the very beginning. You know, right after Moses comes down from the mountain and he builds the tabernacle, God prescribed the way he was to be worshipped. It's this way and this way and so forth. And you don't disobey that. You don't kind of go any whimsical way you want. So you have Moses' brother, Aaron, became the first high priest. And Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, became priests. But you know what? They didn't go according to God's rule. They just thought, you know, we can do whatever we want. It says there came a day. They just came in and offered up incense the way they wanted to for, to the Lord. And it says God brought down fire from heaven and consumed them. Because they thought, oh, I can just come the way I want to come to God. It happened a little bit time later, too, when David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant. And he's bringing it into Jerusalem for the very first time. And it tells us that they put the Ark on a cart being towed by some oxen. Well, that wasn't the way God said. God had told them, anytime you transport the Ark of the Covenant, it'll have poles that go through it, and the priests must bear that up on their shoulders. They disregarded that. They put it on a cart. There was a guy, Uzzy, sitting on the cart, just hanging out there, you know, and one time the, the, the cart stumbled, and he put out his hand to steady it, and God instantly took his life. Because he was approaching, and he was representing all the people. They were coming to God the wrong way. We, we do not have that kind of leverage to say, well, this is how I want to come to God. But does that sound popular today? You bet it is. People say, well, I, this is the way I worship God. Oh, this is the way I worship God and so forth. So God says, no, you come my way. And then notice what he adds in the rest of verse 5 and into verse 6. I visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, who say, no, I'm going to do it my way but showing mercy to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So it's not just this commandment, but all of them. If, if we keep the Lord's commandments, we have mercy and love. But this is kind of strange. If we don't, he says, I visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children to three and four generations. Now, now what is he saying? Some kind of people think, well, I, I've heard of generational curses. There it is, man. You blow it, and it's going to happen like that on and on. You know what? That's not biblical. Generational curses, I've heard this before. It's not biblical. Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, God's children shall not be punished for the parents, nor the parents for the children. This statement is not saying because you blow it, your children are automatically going to blow it. No. But it does say, those who hate me, I will visit the iniquity of those who hate me. There is certainly a great tendency that if you have someone who rejects God the way God says he wants to be worshipped, that next generation is going to have a tendency to do that. And we see that in our own culture. We've seen that in our nation. At one time, serving the Lord. And then passing that down to one generation. Yeah, we're, we're going to serve the Lord. We'll go to church. And then the next one, well, we might go to church. And then the next one, eh, maybe from time to time. And then the next generation, I don't want God at all. We could see that. But that's, that can happen. But the fact is, that can be broken at any time. Listen, there are people here whose parents never took them to church, and they didn't want anything to do with Jesus, and here they are. Here you are today, loving the Lord. Why? Because God ministered to you in your heart. You came to him his way. But God is concerned. Don't come any other way, because that's breaking this commandment. So let's talk about the application. That's the last thing we want to see here. How do I then keep from breaking this commandment. Well, as I said, we know that some clearly violated by maybe, you know, it's a picture or a cross or some kind of icon and they're bowing down to it and they're, they're worshiping it, right? People do that. I, I've been in churches, churches around the world, and I've been in a lot of them, where there's actually a statue of Jesus 
And many of the older images they made, some are out of stone, but most of the older ones are made out of wood. And they're literally, the feet are worn off because people are bowing down and kissing the feet of this statue. That's idolatry. That's falsely worshiping the Lord. And then, of course, they have them of Mary and other saints, and that's clearly breaking the first commandment. That's putting another God, right? Violation. We know that people do that. Did you know that people also do that with relics? You know what relics are? Relics, and these are found in churches around the world, relics are what people say are pieces of the life of Christ or even of the Bible. So, you know, a piece of the cross, there's a splinter of the cross or, you know, there's blood from John the Baptist or the hand of St. Peter, you know, and, and there's relics all over. And by the way, they're doubled up, pieces of the cross, hands of Peter all over the place. You, you can't even verify any of this stuff, but it's there in the church and people come and they worship it. So that's a, a clear, gross violation of this commandment. However, we think as Americans, many of us, I'm doing pretty good then. I haven't broken this one down because I'm not doing that and I haven't melted down my jewelry or whatever else to make an idol to God. But the, the biggest question we need to ask ourselves though of this is, how do I perceive God in my mind? Because this is where we break this commandment. I mean, most of us would never think of making an idol and bowing down to it. But if we have a mental picture of God that is false, according to our own taste, then we are violating this commandment as well. I mean, I've heard people say this. I think of God like this. My idea of God is this. Or, oh, my God would never do that. That's, that's not my God, you know. As if we all have our all customized God. Do we have that kind of leverage when it comes to who God is? Absolutely not. Let me ask this question. Is God's revelation of himself different to everybody? The answer is absolutely not. And yet, people often perceive God that way. For example, some people perceive God as a judge. God's just up in heaven, and he's just waiting to pounce. I can hardly wait till you make a mistake, man. I'm coming down. That's how God is. And some people grow up, and that's all they think about God, right? That's sad. But some people think of God as some kind of eccentric artist, right? God created a lot, a lot of wonderful things, but God is very capricious and fickle in his dealing with men. Or he's a grandfather. God is just, he just lets you do whatever you want, man. God is just, just go ahead and do it, man. It's like a grandfather. Or he's a warm, fuzzy feeling God. As long as, you know, you feel good about yourself, God is good with you. You just do whatever. Or God is, a, is a, a heavenly vending machine. As long as you give to him, you know, maybe it's time or money, he'll give to you whatever you want. You see how people perceive God. How we perceive God could be detrimental to the way we worship him. This is why A.W. Tozer, a great thinker of the past, he said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing. It's essential, Right? I mean, think of, it, think of it this way. There was an elderly couple from England, and they were traveling to the United States to, to see their grandchildren. They had never traveled on a plane before. So think about their conception of a plane. They were several hours into the trip, and uh, they were traveling, by the way, on a Lockheed TriStar. has three engines. And uh, the captain came on and said, ladies and gentlemen, I want to inform you that one of our engines has failed. But don't worry. We're going to make it to JFK but we're going to be about an hour late. Everybody's like, ooh, okay, no problem. Everybody went back to normal, right? He came on about another hour later, said, ladies and gentlemen, I need to inform you, a second engine has gone out. But don't worry, we still have one going, and, uh, but we will be about three hours late to JFK. It was at that point that the elderly man turned to his wife and said, you know, if that third engine goes, we could be up here all night. See, that man's perception and understanding of how a plane operates might have brought him some comfort, but the reality is, if that happened, they'd be an anchor at the bottom of an ocean, right? The truth of the matter is, we can't perceive God as we want. We must understand him as how he is. So let me think of it this way. Imagination, our imagination, must never replace revelation. Our imagination of God, how we think about God, how we, never replaces revelation, the revelation of God in his word. And so here we learn about God. If we do anything else on our own, then we're bringing God down to our own level. And we're trying to make God more manageable. And people do that. 
for example, and I've watched a documentary on this and then gone on the website and checked it out there. In Hong Kong, there's a temple. It's a Buddhist temple, and it's called the Temple of 10,000 Buddhas. It actually has 13,000 plus in there. It's the temple of 10,000 Buddhas. And here's the thing. It's just filled with all these different shaped and different positioned Buddhas. And why is it? The concept, their idea is that you could come in and you could find the Buddha that you associate with and then you worship it, right? You know what that is? That's called the Burger King God. When I was younger, Burger King still was going on 40 years ago, but their slogan was, have it your way. That's reducing God to have him your way. So here's what we have to ask ourselves. What is my mental and scriptural understanding about God? Is it according to truth? Is it according to my, my own idea? Is it based on my imagination? Well, this is my God. Or is it based on the truth of God's word? I have to know God's word. And I need to understand that, man, he's a God who loves me. He cares for me. He's a God of mercy. But he's also a God of justice. He's also a God who is righteous. He's an omnipotent God, all powerful. He's an omnipresent God everywhere. He's an omniscient God. He knows all things. I read about him. He cares about me. He loves me. And he died on the cross for me. He loves you. And so here, as we're learning, he shows us how and how not to worship him. So just as we wind down, keep in mind, again, what Jesus said in John 4, 24. He said, those who worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then he said this, the Father is seeking such who will worship him that way. So ask yourself, am I a true worshiper of the living God? And is it based on my concept or how God reveals himself? That's the most important thing today. The most important thing is to say, I understand what God says about me and about himself, that the Bible says that I sin, I'm a sinner, and, and I need a savior. That's why he gave me the, his word to, to reveal that to me so I would see that, but that he loves me and that he sent his son to die on the cross for me to take my place. I understand that. And through faith in him, I can have new life. And, and that would be my prayer for you today. That, that's the most important thing. Listen, Jesus kind of put it pretty black and white when he said this in John 14, 6, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No man will go to the Father, no man will go to heaven except through me. I'm the only way. So you think, I'm the only way. I mean, you got to know the way, right, where you're going. Jesus says, I am that way. And you want to know truth. I don't want to base it on my, what I think or someone else told me. I want to base it on truth here. And Jesus says, I am that truth, as revealed in the Scriptures. So he's the way, he's the truth. And there is no living without life. He's the life. The way, the truth, the, man, that's great. So he's made it all available for us to actually worship him properly and to know him and one day be with him. But think of it this way. There's only one lifeline to God. Only one, just one. But imagine you were really in the Gulf of Mexico and you got caught in a riptide and you were fighting against it and no lifeguard saw you for the longest time and now you're ready to go under. So no lifeguard can, first of all, make it to you. There's no wave runner to get on to get to you. By the time they call a boat from the bay to get out there, you're going to go under. But there just happens to be a helicopter in the area. They've signaled it to you and, and they're over you and you're ready to go and they drop a lifeline to you. What are you going to do? Well, your only hope is to grab on, man. Grab onto it. And that's what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. He's man's only hope. One lifeline dropped down to us, Jesus Christ. Grab on, man. Grab on. And once you grab hold of that, man, all of a sudden there's this immediate, overwhelming peace, this overwhelming joy that God has this, that you could be going through a trial in life. Maybe it's a loss of a loved one, loss of, of uh, work, uncertainty. And you know what? All of a sudden you have this peace. You have the peace in the midst of turmoil. That's the Lord. That's what he does in your life now when you grab on. And that's what he does for eternity. Because most certainly every single one of us here is going to die one day. And we don't know when we're going. But we can know where we're going when the time is there. Thou shalt not kill. That sounds like a no-brainer, right? But what about thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain? that one might be a little harder to admit that you haven't done. These are just a few of the commands God's given to people in the past and to you today, 
In Pastor Ron's current series, The Ten Not Suggestions, he's touching on the Ten Commandments given in the book of Exodus. These are as relevant today as they were in the past. All in all, God just wants you to put Him first and to honor Him with your life. If you'd like to understand these commandments a little more in depth, we have a great resource to offer you. By donating to the Ministry of Larger Than Life, we'd be happy to send you the Ten Commandments book. This is something that can be helpful as you study this subject a little further. If you go to ltlradio.org, scroll down until you see info about giving. There's a donate link right there. Your donation will help this ministry continue to grow and stay on the air. Thank you for taking the time to consider this way of investing in the gospel going out. Once more, you can find all you need at ltlradio.org. That's about all the time we have for today, but we're glad you were here learning more from God's Word and being reminded of what God has called you to do, being set apart from the world's standards. Come back again for more Larger Than Life.